Hi, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Words, Images, and Worlds. Glad to be talking on this episode with author. Uh, I think I can use the word historian here. I think historian might work. Uh, Steve Scheinkin. Steve, thank you for jumping in and talking with me for a little bit. Yeah, thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah. Do you claim the historian title? Is that a not, is that not a officially thing? in any sort of professional sense? No, I mean I'm a a guy who likes to write about history and and nonfiction for young adults, and so that's become sort of my thing. It's not necessarily what I set out to do, which maybe we can talk about. Which mm-hmm. I always find that interesting. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask about your path to authoring and creating, so that that would be a great place to start. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's how I start when I go and visit visit schools and, and talk about what I do. And, and I have to begin by admitting something, which I I just have to get off, off my chest and out of the way, which is that I used to write textbooks. And that's my real link to history, is that it wasn't that I set out to write history, it's that I set out to be a writer. Mm-hmm. Like, like everybody who starts out in some creative field, you just take any anything you can get. Mm-hmm. Any, any kind of job and you don't just start out writing your great novel i mean if you do that's really boring you shouldn't you shouldn't live that way you're, you're never going to do any um, anything really interesting that way you got to suffer so <laughs> yeah I, I just i got this job writing history textbooks and, and there was a lot of research involved very little actual writing because you know they would say all right write about lewis and clark and you have this much room because we have to fit it between this chart and this graph and all these review questions. And and we have to make it really boring, too, because textbooks have to be boring so that they don't offend anybody. It's a criteria. Absolutely. Yeah, it's necessary. Yeah, exactly. I didn't understand that as a kid. I just said, hey, this book is really boring. I, I guess history is boring. But so I did that for years and, and I researched and found all this stuff. I said, hey, this is actually not boring. It's actually really these are such great stories. They're funny, gross, controversial, surprising, mysterious, mm-hmm. provocative stories that sound like the real world and are relevant to our lives. And, and you could just could never get any of that stuff in. We could talk about that or not, as, as you see fit. But <laughs> so that's how I got into it. And, and I just started thinking it was like a slow motion light bulb moment where I said, I, I could take this stuff. I mean, I like to write. I was trying to write stories and screenplays and other things comics and maybe i can take some of this stuff and do something with it and and write my own versions of these stories that would actually be fun to read and Mm -hmm. and that over time became this career love it love it and uh along the way uh, a lot of your books are targeted toward like youth so so what is that like to write for a younger audience yeah, no different, really. I mean, a good it just has to be a good story. And and mm-hmm. the youth connection really comes from the textbooks. I was writing these books for fifth grade, middle school. I mean, these textbooks. So I said, I want to reach that same audience because this is when kids, including me, decided that history sucked because it was just, oh, memorize this name of this explorer and the, the time mm-hmm. they went to this river. All right, you can do that for 10 minutes and put it on a test and then you just forget it. Like, right. like everybody, like every adult who doesn't know this stuff. So, it, you know, when I realized that's not how it has to be, it could re- these could be really great, fun stories. I had everything that you need in a story, great characters, drama, high stakes, twists and turns, mm-hmm. all this stuff. And so it made sense to try to write for that audience. It was a challenge, really, because, all right, let's see. Let's see if we can do it. Let's see if we can. Not just tell kids, hey, kids, history is cool, because that's ridiculous and worthless. But if you can prove it, maybe you've got something. True, true, true. Yeah. Um, I have a friend that's a history teacher, and he talks about the story that's part of it and these trends, these themes that you see over time. So I'll mention a couple of titles, uh, Bomb, Most Dangerous, King George, Fallout, Um and you have a sort of really engaging covers as well that readers can connect with pretty quickly. Uh, very often illustrated books in one way or another. So lots of areas of history that you've explored and shared about. 
Did I miss any major titles there? Yeah, there's sure. the, there are a lot of them over the years. We don't have to mention every one. I'm sure we can put links in, you know. Yes, below. absolutely. You can absolutely. Find the books. But that first one, uh, I just happened to have a few of them with me. This is the old old cover of the first one I did. It was called King George. What was his problem? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you can see this is aimed a little younger. I was writing history textbooks for fifth graders. So that's what I had in mind, that 10, 11 year old. And so it's filled with not just stories, but lots of comics too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I just didn't want it to look anything like a textbook. My whole point is these books, yes, there's all this stuff we want kids to know, but they should be fun to read also. That doesn't mean the stories are light and funny all the time, but they should be compelling and have all the elements of a good story. And so, yeah, that goes into what you said, not just the stories, but the way the books are presented and packaged with a, hopefully a, an exciting looking cover. It doesn't look like health food. You know, it doesn't <laughs> look like something you would just go to the library to get to do a book report, which is often how nonfiction has been thought of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I've been trying to break out of that mold. And there are a lot of us now who are doing this sort of stuff, this narrative nonfiction. It's kind of get, the words getting out that this stuff is actually good. Yeah. Yeah. I see bomb over your shoulder there. I see the cover art yeah. um, sort of behind you. There's also uh, a large print of the Hulk. So I have to ask about the comics connection. Um, yeah. But that bomb, bomb is Definitely, I would say my my best selling, most just the, the the best known book of mine. It came out ten years ago, and it's the story. Uh, it's my take on a spy thriller, but it's all nonfiction. It's the story of the making of the atomic bomb. It's kind of in the news right now with the Oppenheimer movie, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the story of the scientists who made the bomb, especially Oppenheimer, of course, but also the the spies who stole it, and that just became my big hit my you know like the, the book that allowed me to do this for a living it just kind of had a lot of elements again that, that worked really well as a story and people started reading it not just for school but just because it was fun to read mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so that then the poster that's behind me is the graphic novel of it with, which just came out this year and that was many years in the making i wrote it as a screenplay essentially which is how you write comics and uh -huh. then Nick Bertozzi, this awesome illustrator, did probably two years, spent two years drawing the, the pictures. You know, it's science, spies, battle scenes, commandos, it's just really ambitious art. So I love that book. And that's my that's my new one, my baby there. And the, the connection to the Hulk. Yeah, I mean, it's not just that I love comics, but that all the stuff that's behind me, a lot of it anyway, the stuff on, uh, because everything's backward, I have to go this way, yeah. Mm -hmm, all that mm -hmm. Cold War stuff was from my my most recent nonfiction book, which came out last year called Fallout, mm -hmm. uh, kind of a companion to Bomb. It's the science and spying into the Cold War leading up to this climactic moment of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And so I was really deep into not just the politics, but the popular culture, too, of of the 50s and 60s and how that awareness and fear of this new technology, these su super bombs, as they call them, hydrogen bombs mm -hmm. in the 50s, impacted impacted our lives and our culture. And, and so there's, you can see um, a Japanese poster for Godzilla, and they came up with that character, Japanese writers, after an atomic bomb test in the Pacific. Mm -hmm which impacted a, a Japanese fishing boat. They were very aware, obviously, of what of the dangers of this type of technology. And then the Hulk, too. I mean, it's not a coincidence that the comics fans will know this, that the Hulk and Spider-Man both appeared in the same year. Uh -huh. 61? Can anyone fact check me on that? I'm pretty sure it was 1961. And, and yeah, that's when these tests were getting really, really big and really, really scary and and are you checking? I am checking. <laughs> yeah. 62, May 1962. Yeah, there you go. Okay, yeah. yeah. So right around the time that these um, nuclear tests were getting big and, and very real, too, it really became this U.S. versus Soviet showdown that really almost, at, in 1962, almost led to, to World War III. So it's not coincidental that, of course, Hulk got his powers from 
a nuclear test gone wrong in Spider-Man 2 from from atomic energy. And so it was all just kind of caught up in the, the culture of the time. And I got really, I love just putting that kind of stuff up on my wall as I'm working on something, just kind of get me in the mood of that, of that time period. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on the social commentary, I mean, yeah. uh, those characters have been around, but there's definitely, it's part of their origin of, Oh, the, the radiation and the atomic bomb. So yeah 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 not coincidental that that all happened at the same time yeah so i imagine there's a good bit of research that goes in to what you write and what you do yeah my office looks a lot like your background except not <laughs> nearly as neat so, absolutely and, and a typical book that's one of the top questions i get from kids in mostly middle schools i end up get, mostly getting invited to middle schools and you know, how long does it take? How long does it take? And and what I try to tell them is it, it takes two years probably for me to do a book, but it's the same process as what you guys do. You know, you get an idea, do a bunch of research, take notes, mm -hmm. make an outline, do a, a first draft, get notes, and then do a revision, many revisions maybe. And once they hear that, they think, okay, I guess I, I guess that's manageable you know and i really try to convince them if you just have a process you can do anything mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. the research really is about half of that and then the writing i would say is the third quarter that is the first draft is that third quarter and then the fourth quarter is the revision but so you have to like and that's the other thing i have to tell them honestly is you have to like the reading you have to say oh today i'm just gonna i'm gonna read these books and take notes from them Mm -hmm. Now, to some people, that sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> but so you have to think, hey, that sounds like a good day to me. And, and the the it all comes back to that one thing, though. You get to pick. Mm -hmm. Unlike in school, sometimes you get to. But in real life, in this writing life, hopefully, you get to pick what you're doing. So I'm going to spend all day learning about spies in the Cold War. And that's hopefully fun for you because you're going to be spending a lot of time just looking for those little bits and pieces mm -hmm. to create scenes to, to, so that you can tell the story in this cinematic way. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I was also going to ask you, because I know in history class very often, one of the things that students will say is, isn't this just stuff that happened like a long time ago? Like why, why keep talking about it? Um, so just a uh, chance to speak to the importance of, sort of the historical literacy side of it as well. That's important. I'd be curious to hear what you say. Are, have you ever faced that as a, as a teacher, that question? I have. So I'm, I've done more of the English courses. Right, okay. um, so I, I'm not usually the person that talks to it directly, but sometimes I'll hear students say that. And yeah. uh, again, one of the things that I talk about is, is the story. This is a story of how things come to be and you know, th there's that old adage of we learn things so we don't repeat them or we do repeat them because they're good things. Um, so that's part yeah. of the way that I go after yeah, always, it. I'm interested to hear that. I always give, I give different answers every time and I do get that one a lot. And part of it is simply if the story is good enough, I don't think people will ask that question because kids never mm -hmm. say, hey, why do I have to learn about Harry Potter? You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's just fun. So that's part of it. But also, I think I buy what you're saying. It's a story. It's That's all it is. It's not people in weird clothes talking in some yieldy way. It's all just one big story that, yeah. we're, that we happen to be in. And so by learning different parts of that story, we can understand ourselves and our time better. I really believe you can start to, people say history repeats itself, and it doesn't literally do so. But you can start to see patterns. You can start to recognize things. It mm -hmm. makes you smarter. It makes you smarter about the world. It's just a way of doing exercises for your brain. You really start to understand people better. You start to see, oh, I see how this story is going to go because I recognize it from this and this. And so those are a lot of reasons. But I, th I do think it comes down to that it's not detached from us. And that's, that, again, comes down to how you teach it and how it appears in books. And it seems like it's from some different planet sometimes. That it's all one big, messy, 
story that we happen to be in yeah. and then for a little while get to help control yeah yeah one of my favorite history teachers favorite ever history teachers um would bring in artifacts and i use air quotes because of course they were you know reproductions of artifacts yeah. he hadn't gone and raided a museum or anything but i remember when we were listening and learning about the medieval period he had a helmet that you could see like a knight's helmet and so bringing some of those things alive is uh is a really big deal sometimes too yeah teachers make all the difference mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. took it took me a while to really appreciate that's that 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 turned me around in high school when I had a teacher who did those sorts of things and who made it a, a debate, a discussion, not just instead of saying memorize this, he said, Well, what do you think about it? What do you think they should have done? Mm -hmm. Was it inevitable that it had to happen this way, or could it have been taken a different turn? And you realize through through really good teachers who bring it alive, how important and relevant all this stuff is. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, I always like to ask about next creative pursuits, if you could talk about any of those things. I know sometimes projects are sort of under wraps, and that's not always the case that you can talk about things. Um, and I also like to ask about web spaces where people can follow along and, and connect with what you're doing as well. Yeah, I'm always, um, I've always got a few things in the works, just because of the way publishing works, you know, I'll write something and then while it's being copy edited, I'll start researching something else. So, but I do have a book that's coming out in a, a month or so. It's going to be called Impossible Escape. Oh. And it's a it's a Holocaust story, which I never thought I, I just didn't know that I would was going to go there in my in my research and writing. But it's just it's just an incredible story that I felt compelled to tell about a young Slovak Jewish teenager who escape from Auschwitz. It was really thought to be basically impossible to get mm -hmm. out of this place. And I follow him both in and his survival there, which is remarkable, but he and a friend actually did escape in 1944. And that's just the beginning because then they found themselves, of course, in occupied Poland, Nazi occupied Poland, and had to make their way across Southern Poland to Slovakia, mm -hmm. which still wasn't safe, but it was at least a slightly safer place where they could hope to blend in. And they made what became known as the Verba Wetzler report. It was the first eyewitness account of what was really happening in Auschwitz, including the gas chambers that made it into the newspapers that spring and ended up saving mm -hmm. by some estimates, 200,000 lives. It coincided with when the Nazis were rounding up the last Jewish community in, in Hungary Wow! and brought a lot of pressure on the leaders of Hungary to stop that from, from continuing. It's a really, really impactful story, all starring a, a teenager. He was 17, Rudy Verba, when he was thrown into Auschwitz, and 19 when he escaped. And so it's just an incredible story that somehow, even going to all many years of Hebrew school and Jewish education as a kid, I never learned. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was really compelled to find out more about it and then to tell it. And this past as part of the research, and this is also one of the reasons I love the job, is that it's not just the reading, although I like that, is that go going places, mm -hmm. where history takes place. And, and as part of my research, I went on a march, a memorial march in the footsteps of these guys. So we started at the in the at the gates of the concentration camp, which you can visit today. It's this massive complex. A lot of the buildings are still there. And we walked from there for six days to Slovakia. Mm -hmm. And it was just so impactful and meaningful to not just see the land and the landscapes and feel what the mountains felt like, but just to, to honor those guys by walking in their footsteps. Not that what we did was anything like, obviously anything like what they did, but still remarkable. And, and again, mm -hmm. part of, that's the great thing. It's part of the this cool job that I never intended to have, but turns out that I really liked. Yeah, yeah, very cool and very powerful too. And as somebody that teaches about the Holocaust, I'll be looking for that book as a way of expanding oh, the story. All right. Yeah. Yeah. We could talk about that soon then. Yeah.
Yeah. Um, and then web spaces where folks can follow along. Yeah. Um, I hopefully we can put links below. Absolutely. But, yeah, just we my name, be. Steve Shankin, and you can find I update my my website there has has just all the basics, you know, the books and the descriptions of each one and reviews and that sort of thing. And of course they're available in all the normal places. I'm not so great at social media, very inconsistent. You know, I'll I'll get excited about it for a week and say, I'm gonna just post <laughs> all the time now. And then a week later, I like, nah, I don't I don't feel like doing that anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And I just I think the books speak for themselves. I like to I post comics online and 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 other things that I think are kind of standalone and fun as opposed to promotional, I guess. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Did I miss anything in the the talk that you want to make sure to mention? No, I no, I think we we could talk all day about about history and how to do it right for kids and how, what makes it good. But but no, you got the right idea, and I love the fact that that you as an English teacher are interested in this stuff too, because because that really helps it. it when English teachers, science teachers, math teachers, when they teach these kinds of books, I think it really helps bring the subjects subjects alive. And again, gets these books out of out of the health food aisle. They're not just right. there to look at for a book report, but but they're there as their works of entertainment, but they're also there that, that a way of learning all this interesting stuff that that can apply to all these all these different subjects so i just love that when 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 it gets beyond just the history curriculum that just makes my day oh yeah oh yeah absolutely well there, there's so much context that comes in and you know the stories of people really are interesting and my my big theme that i work toward is uh i'm a big proponent of critical thoughtful reading but also recognizing that you have a story and you're living through a historical time period. And, um, you know, we have these stories of people that have shared fiction or nonfiction from the past or past being just a few years ago or, or many decades ago or many centuries ago. But we also have the chance to tell the story of now. So, um, yeah, I, I think it enriches what I do. That's great. That's great to hear. So what grades are you, will you be teaching I believe um, 10th and 11th grade is the the area, the focal point. Very good. That's brave. Yeah. Well, it's it's good. It works. Those are good ages. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know how to teach except to, to teach bravely because every grade level and every uh, content area has its own challenges and moments. So... Uh, that's the way to do it, I guess. That's great. Good, good for you. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for taking some time. Thanks for talking with me, and um, glad to talk with you anytime about anything that's upcoming or anything that's been out for a while. Thank you, Jason. This has been fun.